So those of you who don't know me, um, my name's Kayleen Harrington. Um, I've recently joined the Norfolk Chambers of Commerce. Um, I really hope you're enjoying our offering of virtual events and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I'll put the events link in the chat function, so feel free to view this after the webinar and book on any. They are completely free to attend. Also, if you'd like to present or speak with Norfolk Chamber of Commerce as part of our virtual event offering, then please get in touch with me. I'll put my email address in the chat function shortly as well. If you want to be self-employed but don't know where to start, or if you're picturing life as your own boss and don't want to be disappointed, then this webinar is for you. In the 60 minute webinar, Graham Phelps, trainer of Brilliant Customer Service, will show you proven ideas for marketing, customer development, development and managing your micro business. You're welcome to ask him questions during the presentation and Graham will also answer as he goes through and we'll also have a live Q&A afterwards. So please feel free to use the Q&A function whenever you have a question. Graham, over to you. Thank you very much, Kayleen, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. And thank you for taking the time to, to dial in or zoom in, whatever the phrase is, to this webinar. Um, my goal for you this afternoon is to give you some ideas, maybe some reconfirming of ideas you already have that might be useful to you or others you know about this whole area of being freelance. And now whether you are full-time freelance, whether it's something you're thinking of doing, whether you do a main job and do a little bit of freelancing, uh, these ideas will work. And they'll actually work for you as well if you even work for a company, as you'll see as we go through. Now, I put some slides together to give the, the event a bit of structure, uh, and these will be available afterwards. I'm going to move through things quite quickly. So please, as Kayleen said, do fire off any questions you have during the, the Q&A button on the top or bottom of this uh, screen. If I miss any, you can always e email me or email Kayleen and we can come back to you that way. So without any further ado, I'd just like you to, uh, to get started on this one. Now, this is the promise of this webinar, a highly practical training webinar that can save you time, money and lots of late nights and some proven ideas that really work. Now, just a little bit of context with this. I, I recently moved to Norfolk and one of the first things I did uh, when I got boxes unpacked was to join the Norwich Chamber of Commerce. But this was about a week before lockdown and I was booked into this networking breakfast that never happened. But I thought, no, I'm going to stay with this. So I'm delighted to be giving back something to the, the Chamber of Commerce and, and to all you folks as well. I'm a great believer in, in the networking and the power of local Chambers of Commerce like this one. And I've been members of various Chambers of Commerce around the world uh, many times. Six things we're going to cover today. The OKRI model, defining your ideal customer, elevator pitch, a few marketing methods that I hope uh, you find useful, some sales secrets, and finishing off with some ideas on working smarter. See, the thing about working for yourself is usually a feast or a famine kind of approach. You have more work that you can cope with or not enough. And when you get a lot of work, it goes late into the evenings, your weekends disappear. So I'm going to share with you my top 10 tips for apps that save you time. Now, what do you want to achieve from this presentation? Now, I'm looking down the list here and I'm going to do a little poll in a moment. And it's, it's kind of hard to guess, but I'd like you to ask yourself that question. Why am I here? Yeah, I don't mean in a you know, philosophical sense, although that's not a bad question to ask occasionally, but why are you here right now? What is it you're looking for? What is the challenge that you would like a solution for? Um, and maybe you'll find it. Now, as a background, I, I don't like talking about myself. Well, actually, that's not quite true. I do like talking about myself, but I think it's important to put a frame to this. When I first started working for myself about 30 years ago, and I used to say to my friends and, and ex-work colleagues, I say, I work as a consultant. Now. I'm a training consultant. I'm a business consultant. And they would look at me and go, oh, Graham, never mind. You'll find a job soon. <laughs> you see, 30 years ago, being an entrepreneur, running your own business, what Kayleen called a micro business, wasn't quite as aspirational as it is now. 
right? So it was quite difficult in those days to explain to people what you liked about working for yourself. Terrible hours, but a great boss, I used to tell people. Now, 30 years later, I'm still doing it. I can't quite believe it, really. In that time, I've trained 25,000 people across 40 countries on a range of topics, usually business skills, soft skills. And I've written a few books along the way to while away the dull hours on planes. But I've become a little bit of an expert in these areas. And, and, I, and I begin now to find myself talking to people who want to do the freelance thing as well. And they're trying to pick my brain. So that's why this idea for the webinar came back. A quick poll or three. Let's have a few quick polls. Now I'm going to ask for Kayleen's help here. Um, so could you share the first poll for me, please, Kayleen? Right. Now, if you've never done this before uh, in the audience there, all you've got to do is choose the question, the answer to the question which best describes your situation. Are you um, a freelancer working for yourself or your own business? Part-time, first year of freelancing, five years plus, or um, host and panelists can't vote. Okay, so just need to do that. And Kayleen, I can't see this building up, but um, when oh. everyone's, if you launch the poll, yeah. When everyone's got a vote, you can then share the results with everybody. Okay, I'm just waiting for three more people. Okay. But it so, might be that they've got it on in the background, so. Yeah, it might be background. So when you get about that, so you can share it now. Let's see what's, uh, what's the makeup of the room here, the virtual room. Yeah, results. Okay, right. Can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. 40% of you are working as freelance with other work, which is exactly how I started. And I think that's a very sound move. First year of freelancing, uh, you've left the shore, you're paddling away there, and five years plus, um, an advisor to others, so 7% there. Okay, great. Um, can we do the next poll, please, Kayleen, as well? Of course, bear with me. While they're, while they're in the button clicking mode, Let's give them another question, right? You Do go. you sell mainly business to business, business to consumer, online only, or something else? Which is the main format of your business? This is going quick. So we've got 11 out of 17, 13 out of 17. I think just waiting for a couple more. This will help me share the examples that will be relevant to you. And um, we've got 14 out of 17, so it's up That'll to do. you. Let's, yeah. let's see the trend, yeah. There we go. Okay, as I, as I thought looking at the list here. So 70% of people work in a business to business, or selling to organizations and companies. Okay, great, thank you, Kayleen. 29% uh, online only, that's interesting. Last one, last poll, quick poll please, Kayleen. Last one, let's see what the results are for this one. There we go. The biggest challenge or question with regard to freelancing or running your own business, which one of these is your biggest challenge or question? Finding well, customers time. They're around. thinking about this one. It's not yes. as quick. Um, so we've got nine out of 17, 11 out of 17, 13 out of 17, 14. Right. Let's have a look, see what. This will be interesting to see what the trend is now. There we go. Okay, finding customers in new business, followed by time management, and the lack of support and resources there. Yeah, that's that's pretty um, pretty not common, but it's 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 a trend. Yeah, you you've got to get out there and make your own business, as it were. Managing your time is always tricky. And you, you do lack the kind of infrastructure support and sometimes the administration aid that you have working in a company. Excellent. Thank you for that, Kayleen. Thanks for that. Now, in the setting up a freelance organization, whether you're running a big business or a small business, it's all about goals and everything else is relatively detailed. But let's put some science to this. Many years ago, and I think probably one of the first business books I ever read, and this really does date me, was by Peter Drucker called Managing for Results. And this was a groundbreaking book, and he talked about the idea of managing by objectives and performance management. And this was really kind of one of the first people to get out there and, and say that kind of theory. More recently, a man called John Dewar has written a book called Measure What Matters. 
Now he was a big name with Google and he was inspired by a guy called Andy Groves, who was a big driver in generating massive success for Intel. And they kind of took the managing for results ethos of Drucker and turned it into this nice simple model of OKR. Objectives, key results, initiatives. That's what it stands for. So you have a big objective. It doesn't have to be a smart goal. It just has to be something which energizes you and focuses you. Then you have the key results. These are, these are more targeted goals where you know you're on track. And then you roll those into a series of campaigns or initiatives. Let me give an example. Decide where you'd like to be in two or three years time. Describe your lifestyle, the kind of clients, the business level you want to have, the kind of projects you're working on, and your income. And then work that backwards into a 30, 60, 90 day goal. What have you got to achieve between now and the end of the year? What have you got to achieve between now and the end of August? Because this will keep you focused. And then set down a series of daily or weekly activity metrics. In many ways, it's a bit like running a marathon. And I think that's a good analogy because running your own business is, a, is not a, it's not a sprint. It's definitely a marathon. If you enter a marathon, the best thing you can do is enter it two years ahead. And then you set the kind of training routine you need. But every single day, every single week, you've got to have a target for how many miles you put away. If you miss two or three days, it's going to add up. So you've, you've really got to think of your business this way. Um, and this is how people make their, their small steps and turn it into a full-blown micro business. The most important thing once you've got your goal though is to decide who your ideal customer is. The target market as I call it. Now by the way if you, if, if you want to ask a question about anything do it while you think of it because I'm going to be moving on quite quickly right. So you set your goals, you set your focus. I want to achieve a certain level of results or a business achievement. And now I need to decide who are my best customers. Now, you could say, well, everybody and anybody. I could say every customer in Nor Norwich, every business in Norwich is a potential customer. But that's too big. You have to narrow it down. Okay. So there's three ways of doing this. One is to look at the demographics. The second is look at the psychographics and then combine the two for the best fit. So for example, let's imagine that you start a business as a tax advisor. Now, maybe to a business, to a company, finding ways they can reduce their tax liability. Now, clearly you would want to work with an organization that maybe has a certain size of turnover or is based in a certain location. So you're not driving up to Newcastle, dealing with a small engineering company. So these are the demographics. So you shrink down your market. You then look at the psychographics. Now the psychographics is the attitude, the values and the beliefs of that organization. So you want to define an organization that believes in consolidating their profitability, in, in maximizing their, their profits and their tax liability in a constructive and legal way. Now, not every business has that as a priority. So you need to then further reduce your target market and find the few best fit prospects. You're looking at a list of around 150 to 250 companies maximum. It might actually be 10 or 15 if you're really specialist. Okay, so it's, it's the more specialist you can be, the more you can tailor your business, build a track record and move forward. Another way to think about it is target marketing. So let's imagine I wanted to set up as a copywriter and my particular speciality had been generated in the food industry. And I'd spent many, many, many years working uh, in marketing and advertising and copy development in the food, hospitality and food manufacturing businesses. So that would be a natural target market because my TLC, trust, liking and credibility would be very high in that market because I've got a proven track record. Now, it doesn't mean that you, you can't take business from any other client, but we're talking about proactive prospecting here. So you always have to have a focus on the most important likely prospect because that way you minimize your rejection 
and you'll get that best fit idea. All right. And it's a very simple process. You just begin to think about and visualize the most important prospect in terms of demographics and psychographics. This also has a great benefit when we talk about referrals and also marketing as well. So if you haven't done that exercise yet, take a moment to do that and, and keep doing it regularly as we go through because you've probably seen things have changed a lot this year. And so your best fit prospects from a year ago may not be quite as best fit as they are now. The elevator pitch, the impact statement as it's properly known. So cool because the idea is if you got into a lift in a large building in a city center and um, somebody got in the lift with you and they turn around and said, oh, hello, who are you? And you introduce yourself and they said, hello, good morning. I'm the managing director of, you know, big, scary insurance company. And they turn around to you and say, so what is it you do then? Now, you've got as long as it takes for the lift to go up to the executive suite for, for them to be impressed by what you say. About 30 seconds, right? So if you can't really explain what you do in an empowering, engaging, and impactful way in 30 seconds, you're probably not going to do it in 30 minutes. So this is the idea of the elevator pitch. You can use it online, in your social media profiles, in emails, on the phone, at networking events, everywhere. But it also clarifies what you do, which is good for your own focus. So Try and develop your elevator pitch, write it down, refine it, refine it, refine it. Um, and then when you've got your 30 second impact statement, build one up for three minutes. Uh, there's a great book I just read recently. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a fiend. I was going to show you the cover here. A bit of a fiend for these books. And uh, even now I'm reading books all the time. This is called The Three Minute Rule. The Three Minute Rule is quite a recent book. It's by Brandt Pin of Pin, Pinavidic, and it's brilliant, right? Um, big TV name producer. And he says, you've got three minutes to make a pitch. Because after three minutes, people start thinking of something else. Or you start confusing them. Or they start thinking of counterexamples. So your elevator pitch is really important. Now, let me give you an example. If I was an HR consultant, I could phone somebody up, I could email them and say, I'm an HR consultant, I specialize in all manner of HR issues. And they go, oh, that's very nice. <laughs> so you've got to tap into what it is that people buy when they engage you as a freelancer. So here's an example. You could say something like this. I help companies to increase employee engagement, productivity and morale, and also to save money on hiring costs. I also can help companies avoid expensive recruitment and management mistakes. See, that's important to most businesses. If you just simply say what you do, not what the benefit of what you do is, it doesn't quite empower you as being interesting and engaging. So start your elevator pitch with something along the lines, I specialize in helping businesses too. And then think of benefit statements not feature statements. So a benefit is something that adds value, saves time, saves money, reduces hassle, convenience, consistency of results, uh, risk, all of these things. So if you're a copywriter, think about what is the benefit of having great copy or of using you as opposed to using another copywriter or using the in-house resource. So all the time, think about adding value. Now, this is also true if you sell online or if you sell to consumers. So let's imagine I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago who was an interior designer. And, you know, they, they find themselves talking to people on the phone or on Zoom meetings like this. And they have to say, well, I'm an interior designer. And what they found very quickly is it's not everybody knows what an interior designer does or what the value is. So, you know, is it sourcing supplies? Is it, so, um, is it finding the right furniture and fabrics? Is it putting that aesthetic eye to the, to the property that you're designing and developing and enhancing? Well, it could be any one of those three. 
or all three indeed. So make sure that your elevator pitch is that 30 second statement that gets the other person, the prospect if you like, to go, wow, that's interesting. And the other way of using this is in an email, of course. And if you have um, a referral, a colleague that's going to refer things to you, they need to understand what your business does very quick, clearly and quickly so they can pass that on to other people. So it's, it's a really, really good idea to practice that. And uh, when I've managed large sales teams in the past, um, we've actually run uh, competitions on this elevator pitch idea. And one time I got into quite a bit of trouble because we, we hired a crane in this conference center and we had 500 salespeople and we had this glass box we had built and we hired this crane up and people had to read out using a microphone this elevator pitch. Um, but halfway through, unfortunately, the organizers stopped it because we were breaking every health and safety rule under the sun in this particular event. So uh, never mind, we had to stand in the box on the, on the ground floor. But it was an interesting, interesting exercise. Um, and it's not as easy as you think if you've never done this before. So um, I'm going to go through the questions in a minute uh, and come up with those. So you target your ideal prospects. You get your message really clear about what you do and what the value is of what you do. And then you need to tell people about it, right? So, and I always like to think of this as lunch money budget when it comes to marketing. And trust me, as a freelancer, I've wasted a huge amount of money on advertising and exhibitions and pens and gimmicks and gizmos and lead generation and telephone marketing companies and everything else with very limited success, I have to say. Now, what I'm going to share with you is some of the best ideas I'm currently using and I know colleagues of mine are using that really work. So let me just walk you through these. Now, I can't possibly do justice to this in the short time we have, but hopefully I'll give you some ideas. So the first idea is, is to buy a lucky cat. <laughs> now, you're going to think I'm crazy. I know this. I've got like six or seven lucky cats. People, when they go abroad to like the Far East and, and Thailand and Vietnam and places in Japan, they bring me back lucky cats. Um, and, and I'm a great believer of being positive about these things. And the lucky cat sits in the window and waves outwards. It has to wave to the outside and it waves at the road or the street and it waves money in. Um, <laughs> my cleaners years ago used to turn the, the cat round to face in the house and I go, no, turn it round, wave the money in. So there are people out there looking to buy what you have. You've just got to find them. And you do that using emails, phone calls, networking, LinkedIn, and people you already know. If you, if you go through your phone list later on today or your Outlook or Gmail folder, think of all the people you know. Have you told them what you do? Do they know people that might be interested? Never sell to them, sell through them, okay? So let's have a quick look at LinkedIn. Uh, I guess that many of you have got LinkedIn profiles and will tell me, yes, Graham, I'm on LinkedIn. Let me give you a few tips that people find really, really useful. First one, you've got to make your profile really good. If you sell business to business, find companies, follow them on LinkedIn, drill down to the connections. You can find job titles, by the way, and you can save that search. And you can communicate online with LinkedIn using in-mails and also content posts. And then finally, if you know how, you can extract people's emails and email them away from LinkedIn and even get their phone number as well. Let me give you a few instances. So you can see here is a couple of screenshots. Um, this, is, this is my LinkedIn profile uh, and I'm always posting things up and changing it slightly to keep it fresh. And this is my list of connections. So the first thing I would do is every single day I go through and check who's connected. And you can see there's a few people here. This was an hour ago, 14 hours ago, 16 hours ago, 19 hours ago. And I, I can't reply to them all because I get so many. But I, I try and respond and say, hi, thanks for connecting. What is it you do? Anything I can help you with. So I'm trying to have a conversation with people online. Um, I'm a kind of early adopter of LinkedIn. And as you can see, I've got over 23,000 connections here. So I would encourage you to connect with everybody because this gives me an incredible contact base. 
The second thing you can do is to search for a company. So here's an example a company in Cambridge called Arm. And you can see on the screen there, there's a little button that says follow. And that means I can click follow and then all my followed companies, my target companies, are saved on my LinkedIn profile. So it turns itself into like a mini CRM. I can then click on the link and I can see all 7,800 managers who are on LinkedIn and I can go down to any one of them and invite them to connect with me. So that's pretty useful. You in the past the biggest problem was finding the name of people in the right job roles linkedin makes that so much easier i can search for a job title so in this example here i'm looking for hr directors in norwich who are a second level connection with me and there's 217 of them so that's 217 people i could connect with or if i'm first connection send a message to and LinkedIn, by the way, will also suggest good people for you to connect with based on who you're searching for. So it couldn't get any easier. Post content, share content, comment other people's content, write articles. It takes a few minutes, yes, but it does get you noticed and people get, get commenting on it. And I think it's probably fair to say that I've had some of my best customers find me through LinkedIn because I've been proactive on putting articles and things like that in. And I've even had people that I've not spoken to for sort of 10 years be able to find me and connect with me through LinkedIn. So it's hugely important. Finally, uh, there's a little software program. In fact, there's several software programs, apps, I think young people call them, <laughs> old people like me call them software programs. And uh, this is an online tool and it's absolutely brilliant and it's free for 100 emails. And you can see here, this, this guy is Graham Bud. He's a president and COO at Arm. And now I've got his email address so I can connect with him on email as well as on LinkedIn. And I just have to plug this into my Chrome browser and it makes prospecting so much easier and quicker. So these are just a few ideas. Um, if you've got any questions, far away. Um, I'm not doing a very good job of handling as we go. Uh, I don't multitask particularly cleverly. So let, let's just go through a few more and I'll come back to the list. Now referrals. Such an important area. Such an important area. And this is based on the theory of giving referrals, helping other people with contacts and connections, but then also asking for referrals for yourself. The six degrees of separation is, is a concept that came out many years ago, well before the internet. They now believe we're only three people away from anyone in the world. So somebody knows somebody knows somebody. One game I often play in my training courses is to say, let's imagine you needed a signed print or shirt for a charity auction. You know, a premiership footballer, a famous tennis player or TV star, and you wanted to, to auction this uh, as a charity in, in a local school, for example. Now, if you didn't know anybody famous, you start asking around. Do you know somebody who knows somebody who know, knows somebody? And my experience tells me you're probably only three clicks away, three people away from someone who could send you a signed photo or a signed shirt. It's, it's that simple. Now, we don't need a charity shirt. What we need is new prospects. So you contact people maybe that you know, that you used to work with, colleagues, doesn't matter. And you explain what you do and you ask a very simple question. Do you know anybody who would find what I do useful? Do you know anybody who has this challenge or this problem? And they may say no. They might say, well, actually, my company does. Either way, you say, well, listen, if you do, please think of me and put me in contact. And this is such an important principle. Most people don't ask and don't ask enough. So make sure that you you keep in contact with people and see the world as, as one of two kinds of people. Everybody in the world is either a revenue giver or a referral giver. And that's it. They can either give you a project or an assignment 
or they can give you a contact. And here's a, this is a crazy example, but many years ago, I used to live in Hertfordshire and I was at a, um, they invited me to speak at the uh, women in networking group or something. Bizarrely, they wouldn't let me join. Go figure that. But anyway, it was a great event and I was talking to people afterwards, but they were all self-employed people, but nobody had a sales team to train or a customer service team to train. So I was kind of really light on leads and referrals, which is the kind of reason I did it. And I was talking to this one person and I said, so what is it you do? And she said, well, my thing is I, I make very intricate candles, very specialized candles. I said, fantastic. And how many of these do you make a month? Hoping it'd be like a factory full. And she'd know about six. So I thought, any challenges selling them? Do you need any help with your marketing? Nope. Okay. So I said, listen, what I'd really love to do is to find somebody who, who manages a customer service team or a sales team. Do you know anybody? And she said, well, my husband's the financial director of big name airline. He might know somebody. <laughs> so sure enough, she put me in touch. He put me in touch with a, the customer service manager there and it turned into a prospect. So all you've got to do is build a relationship and ask. It doesn't get much easier than that. Now, the two other things that are definitely worth following through is email. There's a very simple formula called the AIDA principle of attention, interest, desire, and action. And use that to structure your email. And send out lots of emails. Not too many, but just enough. Start off with a nice, clear opening. Tune into something called WIFM. What's in it for me? Lead with a benefit. Think about FOMO. What's... What, what are they missing out on? People like to keep up to date. People like new information. But the most important thing you have to remember is to only sell the appointment, only sell the meeting, only sell the next step. Don't try and sell everything you do over the phone or over an email. Just say, I'd like to arrange a short meeting to discuss your approach in this area and keep you up to date. I'd like to share some ideas with you. It's my favorite phrase. I'd like to find out what you're doing in this topic area and share some ideas with you. It tends to work really well. People don't like to be pitched or sold to, but they do like to converse with like-minded professionals. Tell them what you have to discuss is new, you think they'll find it interesting, and maybe it's slightly different. Talk about your background and where you'd like to share some ideas with them. Work it into a very simple script if you like or a prompt sheet and then make a few calls every single day it's what i call my business marketing five a day not the fruit and vegetables that's another seminar i'm talking here about five personalized emails speaking to five new contacts every day five existing contacts every day connect with five people on linkedin and then send five LinkedIn messages. If you do those every day, you will build a big business. You'll get more business than you can probably cope with, but most people don't. It's not about sending out 50 emails, it's just sending out five. And if you only send out one or two, that's better than none at all. So focus on simple activities that you can do on a daily basis to keep prospecting and keep promoting your business very important principle. Here's an example. Make a list which is combining all the things I've been talking about so far. Target market, make a list of 25 companies, 25 contacts, 25 houses if you like. Speak to one a day on the phone, just one call, one email. Send them some information. Call them back in two or three months time and just keep going. This is the idea I call organized persistence. Um, it's, it's not it's not stalking of course not it's organized persistence that's what it is you see the thing that no one can control is timing so let's take the example of an HR consultant and I, and I get hold of the I write an email to the HR or the chief executive or the sales manager whoever it is and then I phone them up and I get through and I say hi listen I specialize in helping companies like yours to get the best out of their people and avoid expensive mistakes I'd love to meet up with you and share some ideas. 
and they say, oh, no, 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 we're not. We're all taken care of. We've got all our team in place. They're all doing great. Fantastic. Thank you for your call, but no thank you. And you go, okay, and you're on the next one. You call that company and that person back in, let's say, two months' time. They've had three people leave. Uh, the morale of the team has gone right down because the people that left were the kind of the favorite people. You've had to tweak with the expenses and the commission rates, and so they're all upset about that. Um, you're looking to replace people. You can't find what you're looking for. Looking at spending a lot of money on recruitment fees, and then you call. I specialize in helping companies. Do you remember we spoke about three months ago? And they go, oh, yeah, yeah, you better come in and see me. So this is the secret of keeping in contact. If somebody says I'm not interested, it means I'm not interested right now. After the fourth or fifth attempt, the fourth or fifth contact, you are now familiar and they are more likely to accept your request for a meeting. And this is what social media is really about, is to make your name and your face and your business familiar to your target prospects. The three secrets for winning more business are these. Focus on the customer, persuade through involvement, and earn the right. Earn the right is about credibility, how you act, how you behave, the way you walk, the way you talk. If there's a phrase that I'd like you to remember from this simple slide, it's this, telling is not selling. Only asking questions is selling. It's really important. So focus on the customer's world, ask them questions, get them talking, and then position what you do as a solution or an improvement to what they have. Always, always, always. Now, we're getting towards the close now, so I'm just gonna finish off the, the next few slides and then have a look at the Q and A's, and I shall ask Kayleen to uh, pick out any particularly, but if you wanted to just fire off a question now, anything that I've mentioned, please disagree, ask for qualification, qualif clarification, or an example. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, you're either in a feast or famine situation, and nobody ever starts their own business to look forward to the administration and paperwork. If you're an HR consultant or an engineer, or an interior designer or a copywriter is because you want to go out there and make a name for yourself and spend as much time as possible getting paid for those things and those skills that you love to use. So being self-employed or freelance means you have to do a lot of the stuff yourself that you don't want to do, like accounting and admin and tax and VAT forms and paperwork and all those things. You can tell I love paperwork, right? There's only three ways of doing it. You delegate it, you automate it, or you force yourself to do it. That's the last resort in my world. So I'd like to just share with this list, it be in the slides if you request them, my 10 favorite apps that help me run my business today. And I know many people feel the same about these things. The first one is of course LinkedIn. It is the biggest single asset for marketing anywhere today. And I'm talking about the free version of LinkedIn. I mean, I do have the sales navigator version, but you don't actually need it unless you're spending a lot of time on LinkedIn. Use a CRM. My favorite is one called Less Annoying CRM. Uh, I just thought the name was terrific because I've used CRMs for many years, customer relationship marketing, things like Salesforce and Dynamics and HubSpot and these, and they're kind of expensive and they're very complicated and they keep popping up and trying to sell you things. Less annoying is like 10 pound a month and it does everything and it's so simple and easy and there's no upgrade they keep trying to push, push you on. And so find a CRM that works for you, but that's my one of choice. Zoom, I couldn't run a business without Zoom. I can't do face-to-face -face meetings with clients, and I'm sure many of you have the same struggle, but most people are now conducting business online. Teams, Zoom, get meetings, whatever it happens to be. Getprospect.io is the program I use to get emails out of LinkedIn, and there's one called Lusher, which gets the telephone numbers as well. I get 100 emails free of charge, and I upgrade a little bit, and I can get a few more. It's terrific. 
Duck Soup. It's a very strange name. No idea why it's called Duck Soup. It's an automated LinkedIn connection tool and messaging tool. So I can send 200 messages a day to my connections on LinkedIn and it doesn't take any of my time at all. It's like having a kind of freelance virtual assistant working through my LinkedIn profiles. Zoom mail is nothing to do with Zoom that we're using now. It's an email system. There are others like MailChimp and, and MailerLite and people like that. But using a professional email marketing system takes a bit of time to set up, but long term, it does work dividends. A lot of businesses, big businesses too, do a lot of very clever sales from email marketing. Calendarly, you can see on the screen, I've got a print of that there. It's an online diary system. I send people a link, they put a, an appointment in my diary. It's quick, it's easy, and it works really well with online, online meetings. It saves a lot of time going backwards and forwards, trying to organize meetings. Buffer is a program that automates social media feeds. There's another one called Hootsuite, Meet Edgar. There's dozens of them. Pick one, load it up, and you can become a high producing social media ninja in your part time spare time. It automates everything. It's terrific. Wave apps is what I use to do my accounts. For some reason, every time I turn the radio or television on, someone's trying to sell me a, a QuickBooks or a Zero or, or whatever it is. Um, I've been using Wave apps for about 10 years. It's completely free. I get it connected in with Stripe now for online payments. Uh, it's a really easy to use program. Absolutely bulletproof. Um, having said that, now you got, I'm going to switch it on next. It's going to break, isn't it? Right. But Find yourself an online, easy to use accounting system. It does my VAT, it does everything. And finally, Google Enterprise or G Suite is a kind of industrial level version of Gmail and G Drive and all those things designed for business. And it's a fraction of the cost of having your own servers or own online systems and so on. Um, so I would definitely recommend if you're looking for a way of creating a corporate level email with your own domain, uh, not using a Gmail or Hotmail account, go for that one. So hopefully in that presentation today, there's some ideas. Um, let's let's pause there and see what questions we've got, right? Uh, have we got have we got any good questions there, Kaylee? Any anything you, you can spot? Thanks um so much, Graham. I'm still yeah. uh blown away by how many connections you have on LinkedIn. I don't know if anyone else is. <laughs> I, I even know a few of them, right? Don't forget, <laughs> right? Um, um feel free as well for people to add more questions in. I know I was far busy listening than I was writing questions. Um, so we've got a couple so far. So um, I guess we can go for the first one, which is what is FOMO? FOMO. Well, I, I didn't know what this was until uh, a while back. And, and uh, someone told me it stands for fear of missing out, you see. Um, and it's an internet kind of hashtaggy thing. I, I'm not quite sure what hashtag is, but it makes me sound cool if I keep saying it. Fear of missing out. Uh, I used to express it as being people love to be kept up to date. So, and that's kind of probably one of the reasons you're here today is you want to keep up to date with ideas. Um, and in the corporate world, people don't want their boss walking in and saying, hey, have you heard about this company? Or have you, oh, have you heard about this, this principle? Or why aren't we doing this? So people like to keep up to date with something new, interesting or different. And uh, it's, it's a trigger, by the way, marketing people use a lot. Um, I remember reading a, the side of a packet of cleaning products in the kitchen a few weeks ago, and it said new, big letters, new, improved, right? And when I read the small print, it said new, improved packaging, same contents. But it gets people to buy it, right? So if you wanted to, to get in a meeting with someone, don't tell them what you do. Tell them you've got some new ideas that you've learned from other businesses you'd like to share with them. And they probably want to meet with you just to find out what they are. So that's kind of that's kind of interesting. Um, and this is true, by the way. I know in in the law profession, I think one or two of you are from the legal profession. Um, if you're trying to talk to an individual or to a company, they may tell you they've already got a specialist legal firm. They have in-house counsel, but then say, yeah, but this is different. I'd, I'd like to talk about something new. 
and they don't want to miss out. So FOMO is a fear of missing out. Okay. So that's Thanks, that. Richard, for that question. Um, we've also got an anonymous question. How can I impress someone in 30 seconds or three minutes? Okay. Um, usually through careful preparation, it, it's, it's uh, unlikely you're going to do it off the top of your head, right? So um, there's a question here also about networking meeting one-to-one. -one. So what, what you would tend to do in a, even an online networking, you always ask the other person, say, so what is it you do? And you let them explain their business and their role. And then maybe another follow-on question. So how did you get into being a solicitor? How did you get into being an architect? And then you can counter that with what, what you do. And you say, well, what I do is after spending 15 years working for so-and-so, I now work as a freelancer specializing in helping individuals, helping businesses to ding, 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 ding. Right? So, so just complete the sentence, I specialize in helping companies too. And then tick the big boxes, save money, improve productivity, peace of mind, you know, these kind of things definitely and the more you can specialize the better so i was talking recently to someone who's a family lawyer and i said well what what kind of family law do you specialize in and they said all kinds of family law <laughs> well if you introduce yourself to somebody in a networking event that doesn't sound very engaging so i specialize in you know try and find that niche that you work in that niche that you work in it's very important 30 seconds practice it, write it down, memorize it. Um, 30 minutes, three minutes, by the way, is 30 minutes with all the boring stuff left out. And I'm quoting from the book there. So, so uh, it's absolutely true. If you deliver a 30 minute presentation about what you do, you've only got three minutes to make that big impression. Good. Um, Thank you. Okay. So we've got a question from Rachel. Do you find telephone marking works? i.e. cold callers aren't popular generally. Okay, um, cold calling, people, <laughs> how can I start this? Cold telephone works, it does absolutely work. If you start your own business, you've just got to get happy with interrupting people. That's it, you interrupt them every time you send them an email, you send them a message on LinkedIn, you send them a connection request, you make a phone call. Just get good at interrupting people. Um, but you have a reason to interrupt them. Be interesting, have done your research. Um, but I don't believe in cold calling. I believe in something called warm calling. So what I would do, I send them an email or a LinkedIn message, and then I'd make a call to follow it through. Hi, hey, listen, I sent you an email yesterday. I just want to make sure you receive that. And do you have a moment to talk right now? So I'm very polite. And by the way, my, my biggest tip, and if you think about me, I've spent a lot of time teaching salespeople how to sell. And I woke up a few years ago and realized the more you try and sell things to people, the less interested they are in buying from you. So don't sound like a salesperson when you phone up, right? Now, this might be easy for the most of you, but for me, I have had to unlearn that kind of, hi, good morning, my name's Graham, I'm calling from, I wonder if you're interested in, Shoom. you know, I get ringing tone so fast if I try that today. So I have to phone up now and speak very slowly and say, Mr. Johnson, I was looking at your website yesterday and I noticed that you've just recently uh, unfurloughed a number of staff and opened some new branches. I wonder if we could have a quick conversation. I've got some ideas I'd like to share with you that I think you'll find of interest. So it's, it's that kind of approach. But make five calls a day. Start off with people you know. Ask them if they know anybody who. And then send out five emails and follow them up you'll be amazed how much easier it is than you think. Absolutely. So um, I must think I'm a terrible person encouraging people to cold call. But, but if you can work out a better or a cheaper way of targeting companies and making connections, please tell me. Um, absolutely. Okay, now I know we're running out of time and I know we're up against lunch. And there's one thing I've learned over the years is never compete with lunch. So, um, I would like to thank you very much for the two most important things in the world, which is time and energy and bringing it to the webinar today and supporting Kayleen in the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and please do that because it's such an important um, function of bringing people together 
And, and the one thing I would say of being on your own as a freelancer is you're not on your own. There's an awful lot of other freelancers out there. And so get together online, get together for coffee and create something like a, a networking group of your own five or six people, ideally that can pass referrals to and fro. So if you're a quantity surveyor, have a friendly builder, a friendly conveyancer, a friendly legal person, you know, whatever it is that so in the same sort of industries, but you can be a mutual support network as well. So Kayleen, I'm going to hand back to you now. If you have any more questions, send them in. One question that I one think question. is great Go on, um, to end with. So um, this is from Stacey. Knowing what you know now, what is the one thing you'd say to yourself when you were thinking about setting up your own business? Do it. Just go for it. I have never regretted it. I had doubts and for about 12 months I did a job and worked freelance until I got the confidence and uh, you know I, 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 I love what I do most of the time apart from the paperwork but put everything in place get yourself three to six months of, of uh, a cash flow if you like and build your network and, and start I mean it never is the right time it's only the time so take time to plan but when you're ready to go go for it and you will you will go through a lot of kind of dissonance cognitive dissonance but at the end of it you'll get to the end of your two or three year goal and you'll be so satisfied because you've done it and you're working for yourself that's it good question lovely thank you it was i didn't want to get it missed out because it was a great question um yeah. so thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon i won't be much longer because i appreciate everyone's hungry i know i am one of those people um, so thank you all for your um, messages. I can see that um, a lot of you found it really useful. So thank you, Graham, for sharing your knowledge and expertise with us this afternoon. And for those of you who might have missed um, earlier on when, um, if you were a little bit late joining, um, I'll share the presentation um, after I've had my lunch. I hope that's okay. Um, with you all and then we'll also as soon as the recording is available we'll share that with you as well so yeah that's it we're finished just want to say thank you um to everyone thanks to graham i don't know if you want to say no thank you kayleen oh, that's yeah. it i'm done thank you very much have a good afternoon everybody thank have you very enjoy much. the rest of your day everyone and see you hopefully soon cheers bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.